Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming out to our presentation and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Zach Young. Uh, this is Mason Kolbeck and our partners are uh, Rochelle McKeown and uh, Jacob Terry. Today we'd like to talk to you about a flowable electrode capacitive deionization system uh, with energy recovery. So uh, we'll start off by taking a look at the picture of the world today. Uh, what we see here is a picture of water stress across the world. What you'll realize is there's a lot of stress in some of the most populated regions across the earth. Uh, both in high and low wealth areas, which is a basis uh, um, or based upon the fact that there is a physical water scarcity. Uh, there's a problem with these people being able to get access to water. And this is perhaps unsurprising given the fact that 3% of the world's water resources are fresh and only 1% of that is in easily accessible surface uh, uh, resources. And so there's a massive amount of water that we have available that is saline uh, and we need to find a way to master our ability to procure this water as our population continues to grow. So taking a look at the saline water market, uh, we can first take an example of the United States. There's a massive brackish water groundwater table uh, that is not currently being exploited in some of the most uh, agriculturally active regions of the United States. Uh, this is a huge potential that is not really being addressed as of yet. In addition to this, if we take a look at the worldwide desalination infrastructure investment, it's been growing uh, quite a bit over the last few years and it's going to, going to continue to grow as the population continues to increase. So what are people spending all that money on to get all that water out of the ground? Well, the primary uh, methods used in commercialized uh, applications so far today are reverse osmosis, which consists of forcing the salt water solution through a membrane to uh, produce clear water on the other side, and distillation, which consists of evaporating water and then condensing it to get a purified form. Now, what we propose in a way to solve the problems that were just mentioned, and an alternative to these applications, is a capacitive desalination flow cell with a flowable carbon electrode for uh, continuous operation. So taking a step back, let's address the fundamentals of desalination. So if we have salt in water, we have it in its ionic form. What we can use is electrostatic forces to move that in solution, in this case, applying an electric potential. So this manifests in one design uh, that we're going to work with, which is capacitive desalination. So we use a porous electrode, often made of carbon, that is put at a uh, elevated potential compared to the salt solution. Uh, this draws the ions out of the solution and into the uh, electrode where the ions are held as the water continues to flow through. So the magic in this is happening at the nanoscale. We take a look at a principle called the electric double layer. This is used in supercapacitors and is just the same here. We have our, our carbon material which has an electric potential and what happens here is that to compensate for that charge in that phase, we have a movement of the ions from uh, the water phase to come close to that uh, carbon material. So those ions diffuse to the surface of those particles. Those particles hold onto the salt uh, within their pores. Uh, in this case, we, we're using a porous carbon material. Uh, in this case, that carbon happens to be activated carbon, uh, next slide. Um, <laughs> which uh, we see here. So this is an SEM image that gives you an idea of the structure. Uh, so uh, what we have here is we steam activate the carbon to give it a porous um, uh, su uh, surface and what happens here is we get a great increase in the surface area and therefore the absorbency uh, for it to hold more salt. And so that salt enables it to be uh, functional uh, for this kind of application. So these basic principles have been understood for about 50 years when it was first uh, conclusively shown that capacitive deionization was a method that could be used for desalination. However, the field lay fairly dormant for decades until the mid-90s when it experienced a renaissance and they discovered that porous, high surface area carbon materials can be used to drastically improve the properties. And then since then, there's been a lot of interest in the field, which has culminated in membrane capacity, uh, capacity have been uh, implemented, in addition to applications in various fields, to get the field where it is today. And the reason there's been so much interest is that the competing solutions have a few pitfalls. Membrane uh, so, uh, methods, such as reverse osmosis, as I mentioned, require very high energy to create the very high pressure needed to force the salt water solution through the membrane. In addition to this, the act of forcing water through a membrane induces uh, fears of biofouling concerns. Thermal methods have a significant problem in terms of energy. Water takes a lot of energy to heat up, especially to its boiling point. The fact is that you cannot uh, get this in an easy way, and this will require dependence on natural gas or some other method to perform this. But the fundamental underlying concept here is that they're both thermodynamically limited. As it's been said that when you do membrane or thermal, you take water out of salt. When you take use capacitive deionization, deionization water, you take salt out of water. And this means that it has a lower fundamental thermodynamic limit that can be, uh, uh, can be striven for as the industry matures. With that in mind, we want these goals in as we explore the 
CDI as a method. So obviously you want it to be water efficient. In a water poor area of the world, you want to use the most of your water. In addition to this, you also want energy efficiency, as this will drastically drive down costs as energy is a huge expenditure in desalination. And in addition to this, environmental sustainability is also important. You don't want to have uh, side effects in the process that uh, pollute existing water supplies. And culminating all this together, the goal is to get a cost-effective solution that uses little energy, sustainable materials, and can be provided as an economic alternative. The w However, there's a couple problems preventing this. First of all, electrodes saturate. As ions diffuse into the electrode, the electrode gets covered in salt, and it can't perform its duty as well. This leads to the second problem, that it has to become a discontinu discontinuous process, and that you need to shut down the cell, reverse the potential, get the salt out of the electrode into a waste feed, and then flow it away. We propose a solution to this in the form of a flowable electrode. Instead of having a solid state of carbon electrode or iron electrode, what we, uh, what we propose is that we have a slurry of suspended particles of activated carbon to provide a high porosity flowable um, electrode that we can simply pump out once it becomes saturated and we reduce the, uh, the lack of performance that is tended to that. In addition to this, continuous en energy uh, recovery. So when you pump the solution away, you can have a second cell with a reverse potential to put the, uh, the desalinated salt that you've collected back into a waste stream and you can recover this current and feed it into your original current for drastic energy savings. So with all of these theoretical understandings in mind, we take a look at the simple input and output of the system. We have our fresh slurry, which we input into the flowable electrodes, and the brackish water we input. When we take out the slurry, we want to make sure we keep it separate, since that energy we've input can be recaptured later, as Mason stated. And so this is the first iteration of our flow cell. Uh, this render gives you a cross-sectional view. Uh, similar to the block diagram in the previous slide, we have the blue arrows bringing the water into the center channel. And then the two carbon, or two electrodes in which the carbon slurry channels are, uh, are carved. And so uh, the carbon flows into each respective side and out of the system. Uh, what's important to mention here are the internal dimensions. So if you take a look at uh, the center channel's uh, depth, we only have it at 1.5 millimeters. This is important because what's the rate limiting step is removing those ions from the solution. And the smaller we can make that separation distance, the faster that can happen. So in doing so, we needed to make sure that we picked the right materials for the job. Uh, we picked 6061 aluminum, a standard uh, selection, which is easy to machine for our outside clamping plates and as our manifold. Uh, insulating between those was the neoprene rubber, which kept uh, the water in, uh, in its respective places by being waterproof, while also being non-conductive and insulating the clamping layers uh, from the uh, current collectors. The current collectors, we used 316 stainless as an industry standard for saltwater applications. Now, we've spoken a few times about the existence of these membranes, but they're not simply just to separate the carbon from the center channel. They perform a much more important function. These are ion-selective membranes. And so in the example here, we have a cation exchange membrane, which only permits the passage of the positive ions. So when these enter the channel here, we're essentially blocking any movement uh, due to a salt, gra salt gradient between the center channel and the carbon uh, electrode. In addition to this, Whenever the carbon electrode is charged, there's a movement of the co-ions away from the surface of that activated carbon. This compensates the potential we've applied, but by blocking its diffusion out into the center channel, we actually create an increased concentration of them in the interstitial spaces, which even further increases the capacity of the electrode. So now that we know the materials we want and how to design them, we need to figure out the dimensions. And the reasoning for this was a two-fold process. First, we created a console model of, of, a, de of, a, of a capacitive cell that shows us the concentration and electric potential as it flows through the cell. As you can see on the chart on the left, the concentration of the uh, feed water comes in equal. But as it progresses through the cell, more and more salt diffuses into the outer uh, channels, which are the electrodes, while decreasing the amount in the center channel, the sea, uh, salt water feed. This is obviously the main goal of desalination. And the reason this is possible is because of the electric potential as demonstrated in this chart, which provides the force that uh, takes the ions and diffuses them into their respective channels. We took this information, we used it, into, and we entered it into the Nernst Planck equation, as that's an equation that determines the ion flux in a direction based on the concentration and potential gradients, so we could determine an idealized size of a cell that we would want for the characteristics we needed. In addition to this, we also wanted to optimize the electrode material that we use. So, as it makes sense, adding activated carbon would increase the performance of the electrode, and that it would drastically increase the surface area. It would also increase the conductivity as the more, um, the more activated carbon that we add, 
the more it interacts with itself in the electrode, creating a percolation network that can increase the conductivity of the electrode and drastically reduce the ohmic losses that can occur over it, which will increase the gradient in the center cell. However, there is a trade-off. Once you add enough carbon, you start getting a very viscous material. There's no point trying to make a flowable electrode if the electrode can't flow. So what we had to do is we had to find a compromise between the properties that uh, activated carbon brought while avoiding the viscous pitfall. And we did this by, uh, we settled around 20% as this provided the most we could re uh, reasonably use in the cell. And in addition to this, we also wanted to include the conductivity of the cell. We did this by exploring the uh, possibility of carbon black as it was reported in the literature. Unfortunately, it's incredibly insoluble in water and didn't really provide the uh, solution we needed. So what we did was a fairly counterintuitive approach and we added salt to the slurry. I know what you're thinking, adding salt to a desalination system doesn't really make a lot of sense. However, when you add it to the slurry, behind the ion exchange membrane, there is no chance of it diffusing back into the um, feed water, and this also drastically increases the um, conducti conductivity of the material. And so with the understanding of the slurry, one of the important uh, designs that we put into uh, the cell was uh, for the current collector, we actually created a serpentine channel. The reason for this was to ensure we had effective mass transport through that, uh, that electrode. Understanding that this is a very high aspect ratio, ratio cross section, uh, it's important that we tried to reduce that and instead use a serpentine channel to co cover the same interfacial area while making the actual channel itself smaller to ensure that we effectively move the saturated carbon out of the electrode. And so this is a quick picture. Uh, on the right we have the uh, assembled cell or uh, the fabricated cell after uh, we finished in the machine shop and then the assembled cell here. So having this now put together, we did some initial flow testing to validate the uh, mechanical design of the system. Uh, we ran into some initial problems with uh, poor gasket fabrication, uh, which we addressed quite quickly. However, there was a persistent issue with the membrane sealing against uh, the uh, gasket and the stainless steel. And so we tried gluing this to create a permanent seal, but um, ultimately there was still another issue in that the membrane was collapsing in the center of the cell um, because of a lack of stiffness. And so with these things in mind, we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, so this cell is fundamentally flawed. We've learned a few things though, so let's work on another iteration. And so this is what we see here, and we addressed those two concerns uh, directly. Uh, the first of which was the leakage. Uh, that was addressed uh, by moving the uh, fluidic uh, interface planes uh, to separate levels so that there was no crosstalk between those uh, inputs. Uh, and furthermore, uh, glued um, the membranes into the current collectors in an inset uh, design to make sure there was absolutely no way for that uh, carbon slurry to contaminate the center stream. And in addition, uh, reduce the width of the center channel by an order of magnitude uh, to address the issue of the membrane collapse. Now that we created the second iteration, it was time to start testing. Our first initial flow through test didn't show a drastic change outside of the error margin of a conductivity probe that we were using to measure the salinity of the uh, solution. So what we did was we did a nine hour test of a, the same 110 milliliter, uh, three gram per liter solution. That's the solution that correlates with brackish water. And we wanted to see how, what would happen over time. Now, far from the expected 40 millisiemen per centimeter drop that you would expect in a correlation between the drop from brackish salt water concentration down to freshwater salt concentration, in fact, we actually noticed a small uptick of a two or three millisiemens. We believe that this happened, uh, occurred because of a couple of reasons. First, uh, the cell was obviously not desalinating, but second, the uh, salt water, uh, high salt water concentration in the electrode was possibly diffusing back over a period of hours. However, even though we didn't, wasn't doing what we wanted to, the cell still had something going on. As you can see, when we add more and more voltage to the cell, more and more current happens. This suggested that there is a phreatic process competing with our desalination attempt occurring within the cell. So how does this relate to our design goals? Well, water efficiency and energy efficiency were obviously unable to prove or disprove based on the results of this. We were unable to get the, uh, when we were unable to measure how much water we saved when we didn't take any salt out of water. However, there is positive news in terms of the environmental sustainability and the cost effectiveness of the design. In terms of environmentally sustainable, uh, we created the cell, we put it under the exact same conditions it work in. There was no exit material, it was a closed loop, everything stayed where it should be. That's exactly what you want when you're desalinating water. In addition to that cost effectiveness, we were able to put together this cell incredibly cheap using very readily uh, made materials. That suggests a huge possibility in the future of its economic viability as it clearly requires low capital expenditure to get it started. So recognizing the continuing merits of this design uh, and just a few issues, uh, we decided to set out a few next steps to address our lack of positive results. So the first step we would take would be to validate the materials, uh, understand that the slurry and the ion exchange membranes are performing as expected, test any assumptions that we, didn't, uh, we weren't able to test in, in our initial uh, design, uh, 
uh, address one of uh, an issue with some uh, uh, capacitant leakage uh, that I'll address in the next slide. And then the realization of the recovery cell. Of course, uh, we talked about the energy recovery. Without having desalinated, it was hard to test uh, putting the salt back into solution. But of course, uh, that would be something that we would address. And then looking to scale this up. Ultimately, this is meant to be a modular design that we can then move forward with. Uh, so addressing that capacitive leakage, uh, we identified uh, two areas of uh, potential issue. So at the inlet to the start of the uh, uh, activated carbon uh, slurry and from the end of it to the uh, exit from the cell, we have two areas where the current collectors are actually interacting with the water stream before it actually is desalinated. As a consequence, uh, we've, we've concluded that almost half of the capacitance of the cell is coming from these areas. And so as a consequence, uh, the effective potential that was seen across uh, the area in which we were desalinating was uh, quite a bit lower. And so as a consequence, this may have been why we didn't get any effective deionization in the cell. Uh, it's a step to correct this would be to insulate uh, that part of the current collector from the flow stream. Uh, and then speaking of the recovery system, uh, it would have simply been the exact same cell but under the reverse conditions. So putting in a salt concentrated slurry and uh, the same input stream and then concentrating the salt to make it even more salty and have our waste stream exit. So essentially what happens here is that instead uh, we put like charges to repel back into the center of the stream, which works in a twofold manner. We can apply a load which returns energy to us. Uh, this works sort of like a battery. Uh, and then we can take that energy and use it again to desalinate. And then in addition to this, it completes our closed loop. We now have regenerated carbon that we can use to desalinate once again. So thank you very much for your attention and we'll now open it up to questions. The activation process uh, oxidates uh, the material and so as a consequence that makes it water soluble and I mean obviously reflected by the fact that the activated carbon was able to be dissolved but the carbon black was an issue. So I have a question, so, so you have this uh, salt water, one main of red water, so these two states is fixed, two states are fixed, right? Doesn't matter what technology, the energy needed will be the same, right? Yeah. So can you explain why your technology will be more energy saving than the reverse osmosis? Well, yeah. so like the fundamental line principles over say reverse osmosis is different. It's based on the osmotic pressure equilibri equilibrium that occurs. However, CDI is based around the actual um, energy input of applying an electric field to get ions out of a solution. So there are two, they have two different fundamental limits that they can be approached. CDI just happens to be lower. However, as it exists in uh, literature right now, CDI is lower, but it also literally scales up with salt water uh, content, while reverse osmosis doesn't as much. So without an energy recovery system, it's only thermodynamically more favorable up to brackish water, which is why we talk so heavily about that. But if an uh, energy recovery system was able to be implemented, it could compete theoretically across the board all the way to salt water. Yeah, the fundamental difference is that there's a lot of pressure that has to be applied for a reverse osmosis system, which is not present here. We're pumping at a much lower uh, energy, and instead it's just simply, I mean, in an ideal case, one electron for one ion. Um, of course, that's... So then we want to see the calculation, like uh, how much, how many percentage? Yeah, so uh, for, for brackish water, it's around one kilowatt hour per meter cube for capacity deionization. However, uh, reverse osmosis is somewhere at the industry standard, or state of the art, seems to be around three. But then, of course, it changes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.